All right. This is JD again with Polemics Report. Thanks so much for listening in. If you're listening, you're listening on the Bible Thumping Wingnut Network. Take two. The first time there was no sound. Can you guys hear me? I hope you can. We got a lot of stuff to talk about on today's program. Tell me if you can hear me. I sure appreciate it, you admins. And thanks to all the admins for allowing us to do what it is that we do. I sure appreciate it. Um, and also the contributors and the editors of Pulpit and Pen. We are the Rolex of Polemics blogs. Polemics is the field of theological study in which we take what people are saying in the name of God and we compare it to the Word of God. In other words, Polemics is the field of theological study in which we say, Arr, what, what? All right, so if I could put Polemics uh, into a facial expression, Polemics would be this. If you can't see that because you're listening on the RSS feed, you're listening on Apple iTunes, uh, the Bible Thumping Wingnut RSS feed, or your favorite podcatcher, you should watch live so you can get the polemics vibe via facial expression. Again, it's, oh, does this make any sense? That's exactly what polemics is. It's a little bit of skepticism as the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they were taking what the apostle Paul was saying and they were, were comparing it to the word of God, the Old Testament scriptures. And so when someone stands before you, either in real life behind a pulpit at church on Sunday morning or a lectern on Sunday evening or Wednesday, uh, or virtually via Facebook or the internet, you take what they're saying and you ask yourself, is this legit? Is this really what God is teaching us? Hebrews 6 tells us to train the powers of our discernment with constant practice so that we might be skilled in the word of righteousness. So discernment is something that can be trained. It can be something that is taught. And so my desire through polemics report and pulpit and pen is to teach people just how to have a healthy dose of biblical skepticism, not in regard to the scripture, but in regard to what people say the scripture says. Is that a thing is a question that we repeatedly ask over and over again. I've not been with you uh, the reason is because we had a security issue that jeopardized the safety of me and my family. And so I've been dealing with that for going on three weeks now. And so it was a rather serious matter. Um, I'm wondering how much uh, a, a cult had to do with it. Uh, authorities, legal authorities have been involved the whole deal. I don't feel the need to share more than that. Just enough to say it was a pretty scary issue and to some extent might still be touch and go. I don't know. We'll find out. And thanks for praying for my family. That's one of the reasons why I've been absent from the program. So anyways, want to talk about a number of different issues today. A few different videos to play if we can get around to it. One from Kyle J. Howard about Dr. MacArthur. Another one from Stephen Furtick. And then one post about a mediocre church. Let me ask you a question, dear Christian. Is your church dun, 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 mediocre? Do you have a mediocre church? Is it not all that it could be? Is it not self-actualizing its potential? Is it not audacious and radical? Do you have a mediocre church? Praise God for that. More on that in just a moment. In the meantime, we'll start with Stephen Furtick, I think. Why not? Stephen Furtick, the pastor of Elevation Church, discernment exercise for us. Hopefully you can hear this. If you can't, again, admins, let me know. Jeff and Tim, I see your comments right now. Let me know if you can't hear. Uh, pastor McSteroids here. The power of God was in Jesus. The healing power of God. The restoring power of God. The same power that made demons flee was in Nazareth, but Jesus could not release it because it was trapped in their unbelief. All right, so the part that he just made up about because it was trapped in their unbelief, that is what we call eisegetical. And so instead of taking something out of Scripture... He is then shoving that into Scripture. And so what he's referring to is Mark chapter 6, verse 5, 
Uh, I'll get to that in, uh, in just a moment, but I'm going uh, in the meantime to let Stephen Furtick continue. And there's one thing that even Jesus can't do. One thing that even the son of God can't do. Even Jesus cannot override your unbelief. Now, notice the crowd applauding when he says there's one thing that Jesus cannot do. Now, can you imagine being in the audience where someone challenges from the podium or platform, or in this case, stool or a, a see-through lectern? Could you imagine someone challenging an essential attribute of God the Son? being, for example, uh, his omnipotence, and applauding. Now, what ought to happen is that when he says, there's one thing Jesus can't do, there's one thing that the audience should have done when he completed that sentence, and that they all should have sounded like the dog from the Jetsons, or Scooby-Doo when he was confused. Arr, what? What? No, back, back it up. Now, what can't Jesus do? Jesus cannot override your unbelief. I'll let him continue. I see y'all looking at me like, is that true? No. Thought he could do anything. He said he could not. He wanted to. He was prepared to. He was able to, and he couldn't. The power of God was in Nazareth, but it was trapped in their perspective. The power of God. Okay, so the power of God was in Nazareth, but it was trapped in their perspective. So their perspective, which was lacking in faith, did not permit. As a matter of fact, it trapped God's power. Now, by the power of deduction, we can deduce what that means is the power of man's skepticism is greater than the power of God because the power of God cannot overcome the power of their skepticism. That's what Stephen Furtick is preaching. Do you know what Pelagianism is? I explained this a little bit in today's news update, but it was named after the heretic Pelagius, and he argued that original sin or man's fall, we might call it depravity, Whatever happened in the Garden of Eden, the sin of Eve and then Adam, it did not corrupt man's nature so that it left him incapable of bringing about his own salvation. What they argue is, is that man can, even now, still bring about our own salvation by our own ability. However, on the other hand, from Pelagianism, you have the rest of Orthodox Christianity that teaches that original sin has so corrupted man that unless God does something, they would remain dead in their trespasses and in their sins. So man is skeptical. They're skeptical not just of what people like Stephen Furtick may say in the pulpit. They're actually skeptical even of the existence of God, the power of God, the greatness of God, the goodness of God, the deity of God. And so their skepticism can't overpower God. And the inherent problem with Pelagianism is that in order to have this inflated view of man, they must by default have a deflated view of God. So it works like this. The higher you think of man, the less you will think of God, all right? The less you think of man, the more you will think of God. Now, when we Calvinists talk, people will always say, you're making us feel bad about ourselves. You make us feel awful. You're always talking about how bad people are. Well, when we have a proper estimation of ourselves, we will have a greater appreciation for who God is. Okay, now Furtick, that is the popular pastor of Elevation Church, posted that video and said, Jesus cannot override your unbelief. He's referring again to Mark 6, 5. Now, what that passage says is, quote, and he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now, this entire verse needs to be considered, first of all, unto itself, not half the verse, the entire verse. Secondly, it needs to be compared to the rest of Scripture. And third, somebody like Furtick might want to read a commentary help. Because with a haphazard reading of the text, with really bad hermeneutics, it's possible that a completely unqualified pastor may come to the conclusion that Furtick came to. However, 
he's not right. Let me read to you briefly from the commentary of John Gill. He said, not that Christ had no power to work these miracles, though their unbelief and contempt of him were great, but it was not fit and proper that he should do so because there were prejudices against him. He says, this is a very common way of speaking when you are a Hebrew. For example, 19, uh, chapter 1922 of Genesis says that God uh, of God himself, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of your evil doing, or Jeremiah 14, 22, but that no one, excuse me, not but that he could if he would, but he would not, nor was it fit and proper that he should. Matthew 13, 58 says he did not many sites that, excuse me, works there. And so the Arabic version here says, and quote, he did not many mighty works there. In other words, it wasn't because he could not in that he did not have power, but that it was not prudent. It, it, they were not deserving of it. The lack of, of miracles wasn't because he couldn't for a lack of power, but that he would not because it was against his nature to heal these people who were still unbelieving, even though they should have been believing because of the works of Christ. But there's another issue here as well. As we see in the scripture, in the gospels, for example, uh, in the book of Luke chapter five, verses 17 through 39, we see how Jesus ordinarily healed people. He would come to a town and then the friends of the paralyzed, the lame, the blind, the deaf would lead their maimed, disfigured, and disabled friends to Christ. He would then go about his business, walk from point A to point B, and heal people along the way that were brought to him. In Luke chapter 5, uh, we see the paralyzed man who was lowered through the thatched roof by his friends. Well, because the people were not believing in Nazareth, they didn't bring people to Jesus to be healed. This is probably the, the best reason to explain the, the part about he could not. It's not just that he would not on account of their lack of faith, but they weren't brought to him to be healed. And so the second half of that verse says he, he did heal people, essentially, that were within arm's reach of him. There were some sick that he did touch who were healed. And why did he heal them? Because they were within range. They were brought to him. So it was because people weren't being brought. Jesus didn't do house-to-house -house ministry. He wasn't a Mormon missionary with a name badge and a tie that would go knock on people's door and go, yo, uh, anybody here got somebody that's thick? Because if you got somebody that's thick, uh, I'm here to heal them. Um, that's not what Jesus did. They came to him. And in Nazareth, they weren't coming to him. So he didn't heal them. That would be the proper understanding and explanation of this particular passage. And that's what it means. Stephen Furtick, again, proving ironically that he is unqualified. By the way, that's the name of his book. I wanted to get to this video by Kyle J. Howard. I know this is weeks old. I wanted to talk about it at the time, but again, I had a security issue to deal with, and I didn't get around to it. This is Kyle J. Howard, who was the, uh, excuse me, he is the race baiting um, critical change, uh, critical race theory and change agent that was a part of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, student there. He is now back in, uh, I believe, the Atlanta suburbs. He is a Caucasian gentleman who is of mixed ethnicity, and he has identified with the black struggle. Black struggle. Uh, that's my black struggle fist right there, because I'm with you. Me too. Oh, no, that's a gender thing. Uh, Black Lives Matter? I don't know. So Dr. MacArthur, as we have all suggested from the beginning, is going to come out and make some statements about social justice. And he's going to be on the right side because Dr. MacArthur is pretty much always on the right side. And he did. He came out with a post at Grace to You, more are forthcoming. Did he do one yesterday? He did one the Monday before last. Kyle J. Howard, who was sitting at the head table with Russell Moore uh, and Beth Moore at the uh, Martin Luther King 50 event, decided to respond to Dr. MacArthur, and I just wanted to critique this a little bit because it's what I do. Here we go.
So I consider him a faithful uh, Bible preacher. I consider him a spiritual father in the faith. And the Bible is very clear that younger men are to speak of older men um, as spiritual fathers, even when they're saying something critical. And so um, despite how I may be feeling the frustration, I may be feeling personally, um, I want to be clear that um, MacArthur, I admire MacArthur. I'm thankful for MacArthur. And uh, I want to strive to speak in a way that doesn't undermine the reality that he is a spiritual father. Now, this guy said that he was like a crip or a blood, I forget which. He was a gang banger in Atlanta. It was a secret. Nobody knew he was a gang banger. His family didn't know, his girlfriend didn't know, but he was he was totally gangster back then. He was a he was a gangster in Atlanta. Well it turns out both of his parents are attorneys who was raised in an upper class household. Uh, he has benefited from his own white privilege but again, he identifies with uh, the darker melanin count, I guess, that, uh, that is a part of his DNA. And so in spite of his white privilege, he is, uh, he is greatly, uh, greatly discouraged at what MacArthur would say. And again, I'll let just, just an explanation of who he is. He is an ex-gang member, and this is Kyle J. Howard. But to me, with that being said, um, I found the article. Also, he was afraid to be in a room with James White. Just a reminder uh, very interesting and, and also in some ways very helpful um, he lays out uh, some concerns that he has and in many ways makes a clarion makes a clarion call uh, regarding the need to fight or battle against a new uh, false teaching that is entering the church right now and that false teaching is a form of a, a social justice issues and as I read the article, I, I agree with him on what he says. The, the thing that's um, interesting to me, though, is that I didn't know who he was talking about. And um, it seems... I don't know why you're rambling, Kyle J. Howard. He's talking about you. To me, as I was reading his criticisms, as he talked about uh, those who are demanding uh, individual reparations from other believers, um, he talked about those who uh, believe that individuals who repent for the sins of other individuals and their ancestry, and um, he talked about how these things are legalistic. And as I'm listening to him, in one sense, I can amen what he's saying, like, yeah, we need to get rid of these things. But at the same time, I wasn't sure who he was actually talking about. You. He's talking about you. Uh, to me, it seemed as if he was talking about ghosts, no one who actually truly exists. As I, I've been following and I've been engaged in these conversations for some time now, and I don't know anyone who uh, actually believes um, the, the issues or the concerns that uh, John MacArthur seemed to have in that article. Really, really. Um, Kyle J. Howard is unaware of anyone insisting that we repent for the sins of our ancestors. Really. That's the case. Sorry, uh, Jeff's making me laugh in the comp box. Yes, we pent. Um, there, let me uh, <clears throat> let me pull up that post uh, real quick. Pulpit and pen. Let's go to the Rolex. <laughs> okay, here it is. He doesn't know any, by the way, yesterday, there's a post at the Gospel Coalition, why Legan Duncan and who was the other one? David Platt uh, apologize for their racial blindness. Okay, well, first of all, by that, you mean color blindness, and y'all were for that 10 years ago, and Martin Luther King was for color blindness, but the, the civil rights movement of the 1950s, which is commendable, except for a few communist figures in the movement, um, the concept of, of equality between the races as demonstrated in American law, good thing. They all promoted, all of those civil rights founders, fathers, if you will, they all promoted racial blindness. But now, they're arguing against racial blindness and going so far as to repent. For, I'm sorry that I have seen people by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. I'm sorry for that. I, it's too much. I'm sorry. Um, no, actually, that's, that's what we should be doing. And so what you're espousing is critical race theory. 
is to view people primarily by the color of their skin and division into classes such as sexual orientation, victimhood, gender, and race. That makes us all fight and it makes us angry at one another. And that's why that relevant magazine article about Dr. MacArthur where Dr. MacArthur is wrong on uh, ar for arguing against racial reconciliation. Uh, listen, fact check, redneck. Here's the truth. MacArthur did not argue against racial reconciliation. What our argument is on the biblical side of the aisle is that um, dismantling society and fracturing culture into subgroups along ideological gender, uh, sexual orientation, or racial lines is not helping reconciliation, it's destroying it. That would be our argument. Now, Kyle J. Howard doesn't know anyone that has apologized for what their ancestors have done. Pfft, have you seen that dude's Twitter feed? He doesn't know anyone who's argued for reparations. How about Richard Hughes? Reparations, this is from Twitter on August 14, reparations is an expression of repentance. All right. Repentance is a part of salvation. It's a response to justification. Let's be more specific. Where there is no reparations, there is no salvation. Bottom line. Now, what is that? That's the Galatian heresy. That's adding to the gospel. That's what that is. They're all arguing for reparations, which by the way, Jesus Christ himself paid for. Kevin W. Cosby on Twitter, another acolyte and associate of Kyle J. Howard says, the bottom line is MacArthur does theology in the interest of white supremacy. Martin Luther King did it in the interest of the disinherited of all races. MacArthur's opinion does not matter. The oppressor cannot speak for the oppressed. In other words, you're not black. You can't speak for me. Well, Kyle J. Howard's half black. Does that mean he can only speak for half the blacks in America? Or if you're a hundred percent black, does that mean you can speak for all of them? What is that? That's fracturing people. The, the scripture says, Paul writing, that there is no Jew, no Gentile, no Greek, no Scythian, no slave, no male, no female. One in Jesus Christ. This is not. You shouldn't have to pay reparations for what you've not done. But maybe, maybe what your ancestors have done. And you don't pay reparations to someone who they themselves were not hurt. Mr. White Privilege Kyle J. Howard. I'm going to let Howard continue for a little bit. So when he says, I don't, I don't know who they're talking about. We're he's talking about you, man, and people like you. Don't act like, I don't know who's doing this. Who's saying this? You, you're saying it. And so I'm with a posture of saying, yeah, um, if we have people who are one, who are embracing critical race theory over and against the word of God, then that's a profound problem uh, as a reform. That is exactly what he's doing. And he's about to say, as a reformed Christian, dude is not reformed. Stop saying that. It's driving me nuts. I'm a Christian and theologian and preacher. I do believe in common grace. I do believe that there are ideas and philosophies in the world that actually uh, can be true and that we can benefit from. But the world... Including critical race theory. Word of God, God's word, God has spoken. His, div his divine word is the, the bedrock of the Christian faith. And we should never uh, substitute any truth within God's word for any worldly philosophies whatsoever. And so if there's anyone who is embracing uh, critical race theory over and against Christian theology. No, we're not necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying that you shouldn't um, replace the gospel with critical race theory. What we're saying is it shouldn't even be an additive to the gospel. Listen to the wordplay here. He's saying, listen, I don't think that anybody should replace the gospel with critical waste, silly. We're not talking about replace. You're adding to. That's the Galatian heresy. It's not taking away the work of Christ. It's adding to it. The critical race theory is opposite the gospel that brings people from every tribe, tongue, and nation into one and gets them griping about, gets them to stop griping about being Scythians or slaves.
strategy, we have a deep and profound problem. If there's anyone who within the realm of uh, uh, social is engaging in justice within the realm of the, the social realm and is arguing that an individual is responsible for another person's individual sin, then th there's a misunderstanding of the. Um, this is this is wordplay too. what they argue technically is that we're responsible for societal sin. All right. So to be clear. They typically don't argue that I personally am responsible for the sins of uh, James Boyce or, uh, or Basil Manley, uh, to speak of Southern Baptist founders who were slaveholders and who Albert Moeller's seminary and undergraduate college are named after and buildings are, are, are named after and so forth. What they're arguing is we're, we're not held accountable for individual sins. We're held accountable for societal and cultural sins, at which point I say, eh, that's not how that works either. Gospel and the gospel's implications there. And we need to engage and we need to uh, lovingly correct those who may be coming up with those ideas and explain to them that, no, we are held account for all sins um, and we are culpable for all sins. And we are called to repent from all sins and believe in the gospel. Um, that's a very interesting issue other than talking about the government. So if we're talking about has the government faithfully restored, provided faithful restitution for the theft that it has committed against indigenous Americans, as well as what it has, uh, the wealth that it has obtained through the slavery of blacks, that's a, that's a justice issue. We well, a third of the wealth of the South was confiscated in the Civil War in the Emancipation Proclamation. A third of the wealth that was on the books in the South was illegally and unconstitutionally confiscated. Who's going to pay reparations to the South? Now, I know what you're saying. You're talking about slaves. How dare you go there? Here's what I'm saying. How far back in time do you want to go? Can Kyle J. Howard prove that he has in any way been abused or maligned genealogically? I believe his mother is from a different continent. Were his relatives brought here in the African slave trade? I don't know. Do we have to go on the mormonancestry.com to figure that out? Love makes no list of wrongs. Jesus paid our reparations. By the way, as rumor tells it, I have no idea if it's true. I'm related to Ulysses S. Grant. He fought for the North. Why would I pay reparations? By the way, it was white people who freed the slaves. FYI, and they paid for it in their blood, and you're welcome. How petty do you want to get? You can let it go under the blood of Jesus Christ, or you can demand that the government, which, by the way, is consisting of people, by people, for people, you know that whole thing, that the government, thereby its citizens, should pay reparations to who exactly? To someone brought up in white privilege, raised by two attorneys in a fluent Atlanta suburb? We can talk about that as a justice issue and talk about looking at biblical justice as it relates to institutions. Redistribution of wealth is injustice, it's not justice. Institutions and governments, has the government faithfully repented which includes with providing restitution for the certain communities whom they've oppressed and robbed from. They've given blood, sweat, and treasure. Now, there are Indian reservations, several uh, near me, and I love them all very much. And I, uh, I, I do Bible study in one and preach at the other and one for many years, and I am under the firm conviction that Native Americans or First Peoples, First Nations, whatever, uh, Indian folk, have been mistreated by uh, Caucasians uh, gravely in the past, for sure, no doubt. Uh, there's an excellent documentary called Water Busters that somebody ought to write about, or, or excuse me, watch. You ought to watch Water Busters about the um, uh, Missouri uh, uh, Dam Project. I think they built 17 dams up and down the Missouri River on native lands, flooding native lands. 
uh, absolutely atrocious. But I know this, if I go to preach the gospel there and they demand reparations from me and from the American government before they respond to the gospel, before they respond graciously, listen, before they have ears to hear and eyes to see. And that is if they could prove that somehow I was responsible for the damn project that flooded their land and that they were the ones and not relatives in the distant past who uh, had created these problems or, or suffered from these problems. If that was a prerequisite to my gospel preaching, I'm toast because that's not going to happen. Now, we could have a biblical anthropology and say we all go back to Adam. So if we're going to be all held accountable for what our ancestors have done, that ancestor's name is Adam, and we're all sinners in the sight of a holy God. We're all in the same boat, in other words. And like with Kyle J. Howard, how would he, he half of him would have to pay reparations to the other half because he's half white. We have to stop this. That's something that we can talk about within the realm of justice, within the social realm. But if there's anyone who is saying that individual people are required to be paying back um, other oppressed people, groups that come from oppressed ancestry, and if not, that they are some... Why are you only oppressed if you're in an oppressed group? Are there not individuals who are oppressed? Are there not Caucasian women living in, in relationships where they are battered? Are there not... Um, uh, Caucasians who live in underrepresented and underprivileged homes in the midst of poverty. Why do you have to be in a minority group uh, to be considered oppressed? And why are you identifying people by their minority group? Why is it that Harvard can discriminate against Asians because we got too many Asians, they're too smart, and they make it harder for Asians to get into Harvard to appeal to some other oppressed people group. Does that not then oppress the Asian community? Why are we identifying people by the color of their skin or their ethnicity in the year 2018? Furthermore, how do we still do that and pretend that we ourselves are not racists? Somehow violating the gospel, then we have a profound and serious problem. But again, I don't know anyone who's doing that. Uh, what I do know is that there have been many people who have been accused of saying that. I know that. No, many people have said that. We've documented that thoroughly. There are many people who have been misrepresented and slandered in saying that, but I don't actually know anyone who actually believes those things. And so I'm looking forward to MacArthur writing other articles where he actually identifies these ghosts. Um, I grew up. I, I love the show Ghostbusters. I love Casper because he was friendly. But generally speaking, ghosts are scary. And I'm scared of these ghosts in which MacArthur is uh, describing because they sound like they could really uh, affect the church in a very negative way. So I would love to know um, who these people are because, again, I, I know many people, many leaders within uh, evangelicalism who are engaging in these issues. Yep, and they're calling MacArthur a white supremacist, and that is indeed slander. If you're listening, you're listening on the Bible Thumping Wing Net. By the way, we are listener-supported. You can donate by clicking donate. Uh, on Patreon. You can give as an expositor, a proclaimer, or as a pulpiteer. We've sent out uh, a couple of bold dogmatic newsletters in the last two weeks. If you want to receive that, uh, again, you can do so by subscribing at Patreon. We appreciate your financial support. It allows us to do what it is that we do at Pulpit and Pen. So I want to talk about this article, Seven Signs Your Church is Honestly Mediocre. How do you know if your church is mediocre? Well, one of the problems, by the way, this was written by Kerry Newwolf um, at his website. I, I don't know who he is. Uh, he has a book called uh, The Art of Better Preaching. I don't know. I don't know. He's a church growth guru. One of the problems many churches face these days is that they're neither great at things nor terrible at things. Uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the comm box. They're honestly just, they're mediocre. 
Facebook Live has made watching other churches' services easier than ever as I've scrolled through my Sunday morning feed or visited different churches over the years. I've been a little amazed at what I've seen. Unfortunately, there's a lot of mediocrity out there. That probably sounds judgmental, and I'm sorry if that's how it feels, but there's a lot at stake here. When your church is mediocre, it should be no surprise unchurched people aren't lining up to join you and that you're not attracting and keeping the amazing leaders who might attend your church but don't want to get involved because things are so subpar. Let me do what I do best and rip out my polemics fillet knife to this thing. When your church is mediocre, you should not be surprised unchurched people aren't lining up to join you. Listen, first of all, I want you to know that when you call the church mediocre, you're treading on sacred uh, ground. It's almost as if uh, I were to call your wife homely. Would you appreciate that? I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just trying to see, say that you have a wife who is homely. And when I scroll through your Facebook pics and I look at the profile photos in which your wife is present, she just seems holy, uh, homely. She's not ugly as a dog and she's not beautiful as a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. She's just homely. You might want to apply some more lipstick. Put some lipstick on that pig. Yeah, if you do that, maybe your wife will be more attractive and then more people want, will want to spend time with you. Listen, we got to be careful how we talk about the church. It is the bride of Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, a mediocre church is one in which it is not living up to what God would have it to do, fulfilling its obligations as Christ Jesus himself builds it as he would have it. In other words, let me define a mediocre church. A mediocre church is one in which sermons are not expositional they're, or expository. They don't take the scripture and pull out the meaning. They don't explain the meaning of the sacred writ. writ, writ. It is one in which scripture is not read at any length. A mediocre church is one in which a sermon may last 20 to 25 minutes and people must be constantly entertained because they're a bunch of goats that aren't Christians. A mediocre church is one in which the quote-unquote worship service is nothing but an entertainment-driven spectator sport in which people who are performers get up and sing to lost people like they were Jesus' girlfriend. That's a mediocre church. A mediocre church is one that doesn't exercise any discipline and they're as wicked on the inside as they, the rest of the world is on the outside. That is a mediocre church. Now, a church that is not mediocre will have a sermon that lasts a while because it's a special time in which God, the Holy Spirit, uses a man to preach God's word to feed, edify, and equip the saints with scripture. It may be boring in some cases or even drab from the outside looking in. Your eyelids may just go dry and um, get crusted over with boredom from, again, the outside looking in. In a mediocre church, songs are sung to glorify God irrespective of how the audience themselves feel about it. In a mediocre church, the question is, was God glorified by that? Not, how did you feel about that? In a mediocre church, children are catechized, not entertained. In a mediocre church, discipline is done so that wolves don't devour sheep and goats aren't free to roam in with the sheep, allowing them to take some outside of the fold. In a biblical church, in a, excuse me, non-mediocre church, we see God being glorified and man taking second place to the Almighty. In a non-mediocre church, a non-mediocre church in God's eyes, you would be surprised to see, quote-unquote, unchurched people. By the way, that means lost people lining up to join you. Do you know why they use the term unchurched? Because when you step into Elevation Church or Perry Noble's New Cult or what have you, when you step into Andy Stanley's church, what you find is the people there are just like the people outside. They're lost. 
That's why they're there. Safe people don't hang out at Stephen Furtick's church. They don't. You don't have Christians in any volume hanging out at Joel Osteen's church for any period of time. Yeah, Christians may wander in there, new believers that don't know much. The Holy Spirit will soon lead them to the knowledge of truth and take them out. You should be surprised when you see, quote unquote, unchurched lining, uh, unchurched people lining up. But that term unchurched, it's a necessity they use it because they can't say lost people because A, that's terribly judgmental calling people lost. We'd rather call them unchurched. And secondly, what they mean is people that don't show up and attend here because they can't call someone saved or the elect of God or the beloved of God. They can't make that synonymous in their viewpoint with church attendees because that doesn't describe their church attendees, most of whom are lost. He says, we shouldn't be surprised that unchurched people aren't lining up to join you or that you're not attracting and keeping amazing leaders who might attend. Let me, let me, let me stop here for a moment. I wish my church had more leaders. Who doesn't? We all want leaders. But if someone is there for the show, for the production value, for the entertainment value, if they're there uh, because of the sermonettes for Christianettes that will inspire them to live better lives, but not for the exposition of scripture, the last thing I want is for them to be a leader in the church of Jesus Christ. I want them to kneel before God and get saved. So if you're not attracting the right leaders because you're not honeypotting them well enough with things and stuff and bright, shiny objects and flashy lights. That's not the type of leader you want anyway. He says, don't be discouraged. Every leader in every church can be great at something regardless of size, budget, or location. So it's not a question of being a large church or having a million dollars. It's a question of discovering what you can do well and how you can best express the, the mission of the church at the local level. At which point I ask the question, what is the mission of the church? It is to make disciples. That is the great commission. God makes converts. We make disciples. We take baby Christians. We turn them into better Christians. Yes, we evangelize outside the walls of the church uh, in terms of the lost. And we evangelize ourselves by preaching the gospel to us every Sunday. But the church is an ecclesia, a called out assembly of believers. And our job within the function of the local church is to take baby believers and raise them up to maturity. That's the goal. That's the mission of the church. I don't think that we, that is you listeners to the program and myself, I don't think that we see the church as having the same mission as this. That's my assumption. Sorry, I'm distracted with all of my technology. Number one, here's the list. Just a moment. Uh, number one, you have non-singers singing and bad players playing. One sure sign you've settled into mediocrity is that your music team, you have non-singers singing and bad players playing. We've all seen that happen. Singers are regularly off key or flat. Musicians are struggling to keep up with chord changes or can't quite get the rhythm right, all the while being glued to their music stands. And the only people who seem to be enjoying it are the people on the music team. Everyone else is wince, wincing or zoned out or has become so used to it they're now a part of the problem. All right. The scripture tells us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, and I believe that God is glorified by excellence. So if you preach, preach as though you're preaching the oracles of God. Give it all you got. And if you're going to worship, give it all you got. To give attention to God, not draw it to yourself. No guitar riffs to show off your, your skill. Those leading the worship are there simply to assist congregational singing. And the beautiful thing about congregational singing is that the voices, all of them corporately together, become one, one voice before God. Because the good voices make up for the really sucky voices, and they're all brought together in one voice before God. And the worship, quote unquote, team should be doing nothing but facilitating corporate worship. That's what we ought to be doing. 
It shouldn't be about the best, the brightest. We're not here for your entertainment. If people are phasing out, the problem is not that your music team is subpar. It's that they're probably lost because they don't consider the worship of a holy God to be compelling. Uh, give me the more music. I want to hear them better drum. That, that, that needs more cowbell. I got to have more cowbell. No, your heart isn't right before God. That's the problem. And he says, listen, the reason is because too many churches leaders value inclusion over gifting. In other words, they're including people that really aren't that good. Listen, clearly, if someone is going to play the guitar, the piano, the organ, the mandolin, the violin, the harp, the cello, the whatever, if that's going to happen, they actually do need to know how to play those things. But let me make this very clear, especially if you're dealing with a church with limited resources and you don't have that many talented people. I want to assure you of this. Those song leaders that I grew up with in the small Baptist churches where I was raised, the ones who couldn't keep time or rhythm very well, the ones who sing slow songs too fast and fast songs too slow. The ones who didn't know what this was because they were hillbillies and were never classically educated, but they just knew they were supposed to be waving their hands. The people that were put at the back of the choir because they weren't very good, but they were included. Let me make it clear to you. Scripture tells us to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And someone like that, who would me never make it on stage in a megachurch, singing and worshiping in spirit and in truth, is infinitely more glorifying to God than the most polished presentation or performance ever done by Hillsong, Jesus Culture, or Elevation Music. That is tepid, lukewarm garbage with a smoke machine that Jesus will vomit out of his mouth. He would rather hear an old man with Parkinson's and a speech impediment who can't keep a tune lead his people in worship than the garbage that is done at Bethel Church in Redding, California, or whatever kind of polished performance this is. Do you think God is impressed with the shininess of your Asherah poles or the brass of your your temples of ball? Do you think he is impressed with how that brass is polished and how shiny and pretty that is? Do you think he cares about the rich fullness of your groves built upon the mountaintops in which the pagan worship? Do you think he cares for the beauty of the Mormon tabernacle choir? Do you think that pleases him? This is refuse and waste. Number two, bad production. In addition to subpar music, many churches settle for bad production. Poor sound, uh, poor lighting, and a mediocre team running it all. This make a mediocre team running it all. Oh, that one touched me close to home there because uh, the ones in the sound booth at the Fellowship Baptist Church is my daughter and a young woman who I pretty much feel to be my daughter. You calling them mediocre? Are you calling my daughter mediocre? Or the girl that lives down the street who I watched grow up? Shame on you. You call in the volunteers and all these little churches subpar. I have no idea how the equipment works. Most of the people in the church don't. I don't have a sound engineer. If you've watched my sermons on the Pulpit and Pen Facebook page, you clearly know that. I believe that God is glorified. Don't you? Some don't. 
You're better off to have a few good tech things than to try to do many things poorly. Most churches overshoot their ability trying to get as much possible with very little money. When faced with limited resources, and we all have limited resources, investing in a few quality pieces always beats buying a lot of cheap pieces. It's also important to find people who know how to run what you've bought or even to invest a little to bring in, bringing in an expert who can try. You know what this makes me want to do? It makes me look at the Campbellites with their acapella worship and say, maybe those crazy Campbellites are right. Maybe Alexander Campbell was onto something. And then I'm like, nah, no, nah, he wasn't. But maybe just for a moment, we should stop and consider. I would rather have acapella worship with absolutely no production, quote unquote, production whatsoever, than to have this. Now, this guy's hypercritical when it comes to production value. Do you think he would tolerate an attitude this critical when it comes to doctrine or theology? Nah. He put those people underneath Mark Driscoll's bus. Three, school play quality live streams. It's great to see many churches go online and many churches, big and small, are now streaming their service. It's so easy to do. But you got to ask the question, would you watch it? Honestly, I bet a lot of the time the answer is no. Many churches suffer from what I call school play syndrome. Their services look like an elementary school play. Not great lighting, not great production, not great sound, and a lot of sincere people who really don't know what they're doing. Let's be honest, the only reason you watch a school play is because your kid is in it. And the number one question you're asking the entire time is, when will this be over? So, Here's the question. If your church service looks like a school play online, why are you broadcasting it? And the answer is because God's word doesn't come back void. Do you understand? Listen, first of all, what you've just heard is not spirit filled. It's a practical denial of the power of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Do you not think that God and his spirit can cut through uh, a, what kind of camera am I looking into? An HD 1080p Logitech webcam? You don't think God's spirit can cut through that? I, I, I'll, I'll do you one better. I've seen God's spirit work through crying and screaming children so loud I couldn't hear myself speak in the middle of the sermon, and God still does his work but not through a shoddy way. Would you watch that? It, de it depends what it is. You see, I like to consider myself a civilized connoisseur of culture. That's right. I am a, a sophisticant. Is that a word? I, I, I like to enjoy the finer things in life. Now, here's what I've noticed. I say that uh, sarcastically to some extent. I drink out of mason jars, all right? Here's what I've noticed. Some of the best movies are independent films you've never heard of. I'm kind of a cinemaphile. I, I have these hobbies, and I go from one hobby to another. And right now, I'm into independent movies. And what I've noticed is the best movies you've never heard of. Now, I realized this a long time ago when I got into fiction. The best books you've probably never heard of, and they're really fantastic, but you've never heard of them. The best places to visit are relatively unknown, and the finest preachers ever to preach the gospel, you will never hear their name. And speaking as a pastor, let me tell you this. Credit to where it is due. Praise God for Dr. MacArthur. Praise God for the late Sproul. Praise God for Paul Washer. Praise God for Martin Lloyd-Jones. Praise God for all those men. Some of them here, some of them gone. But the fact is, for every MacArthur and Santa Clarita that you've heard of, there are a thousand you haven't who handle the Word of God just as well. They just don't have a study Bible named after them because they're too busy shepherding the flock of God without help like Dr. MacArthur has had with Phil Johnson at his side all of these years and elders that can support him so that he can write books. God bless him. Thank God for the books. 
but there are pastors who have labored tirelessly to preach the word. Praise God for them. They're not going to have a first class production in their church. And if you choose not to listen to them because the camera work is shoddy, you are a fool. But I think we've already established that probably. The question worth asking is, am I helping people come to Christ by sharing this or keeping people away from Christ by sharing this? In the man's point of view, shoddy camera work will keep people from Christ and good camera work will bring people to Christ. Behold the power of God. I mean, the power of production value. You think camera angles are bringing people to Christ. Then he has a lame website. Your info isn't current. You're resigned to it. You're fine with mediocrity. You've resigned yourself to mediocrity. You're afraid to change. By the way, God is immutable. Just wanted to point that out. Maybe we should try it. Just try it for a little bit. Try a little immutability. Uh, it's an incommunicable attribute of God, but maybe we could shoot for it. Instead of be changing every six months to chase after the latest fad. My friends, I encourage you to understand that if you define mediocrity the way this man does, it's okay to be mediocre. Your church isn't perfect. It's not flawless. It's not polished. Real people live there. Real people attend there. It's really false advertising to present the image that everything is perfect. If you go to a place on Sunday morning where you're accompanied by fellow saints and the word of God is opened and preached to a relatively, on a relatively efficient and effective manner, the word of God isn't totally butchered and taken out of context, the the body of Christ symbolically in the bread and wine is dispensed as a means of grace. And the congregation lifts their voice in one voice to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Discipline is kept. The hard things are done. God is glorified through all of it. If that's what your church looks like, it is not mediocre. It's a diamond. It's, it's a jewel. It, it, it's like a pearl of great price. Do you know how rare it is to find a church like that? Where people say, we're not doing that nonsense. No, forget that. Forget it. If, if you don't want a church that will put God first and focus on scripture and prayer and hymn psalms and spiritual songs and discipline and the ordinances, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. We're not playing around. We're not doing that. We're about Christ. This is the way it is. We're going to preach. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to go home. Maybe after potluck. If you have a church like that, you have found the one who, like its groom, is a lily in the valley. Rare. And there are so few churches like it. I'll take that mediocrity any day of the week. Thanks for listening to Polemics Report. You're listening on the Bible Thumping Wingnut. This is listener supported. Be discerning out there. Check us out, pulpitandpen.org. God bless you, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Until then, as always, Simper Reformanda. <laughs>